Okay. All right. All right. Are we good to go? You're good to go. Neil and Brian. Neil and Brian, you're out there somewhere. Brian, I can't see you on my screen right here, but- uh, Well, I, I can see myself. So. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> good morning, everybody. And uh, if, you, if you're not aware, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning there about the snow coming, this is a beautiful time to relax and, and enjoy and just uh, let it happen because we can't stop it, right? So, um, and here we are. This is that, that January affirmation is no good anymore. Well, you could still use it. Just don't tell anybody it's from January, that's all. But uh, tomorrow is February already. We're, time is flying by. So, uh, you know, Brian and I are gonna do something a little bit different today in sharing this talk. It's not that different for me because I have spoken to you on this chapter for at least three years and maybe four years in a row. Um, I happen to love speaking on this chapter because it is without a doubt, as I said earlier this morning in Psalm Sunday, it's where the rubber meets the road. This, this is, I mean, it's how to use it. What, what could be more important than that? And, you know, I, um, I, I'll, let me just start off by saying it really uh, is summed up in the first line, the first sentence of this section of the textbook where Ernest Holmes says, one of the greatest difficulties uh, in, the, the, in this new order of thought is the fact that uh, we are likely to spend too much time with theory and not enough, uh, too little practice, as he says, too much theory and too little practice. And that is, that is definitely true. And the other thing I want to lay sort of the groundwork for here um, is that this is very simple. We had a conversation this morning in the Psalm Sunday about the fact that, you know, about uh, effort and how much effort it takes. And are we trying too hard? Are we trying to make something happen rather than allowing it to happen? But the simplest things are the most powerful things. They always are. They always have been. And when you when you look at um, when you look at some of the things that are the most powerful, they are so simple. And we tend to want to complicate things. Uh, and Ernest Holmes addresses this uh, in the in the book. Uh, and um, it's not necessarily in this section of the book, but um, the when we try and complicate things, it generally drains the importance or the strength out of it. And I, I believe it was Einstein. Uh, by the way, if you ever need a quote, just say Einstein said it. People just love it if you say Einstein said it. But I do believe that uh, he was the one who said, if you can not explain something in a very simple, basic way clearly, then you don't really know the subject. And, and I think that's very true. I think that, um, uh, you know, what's, what, you know it's, what's, what's also interesting is that when you, when you look at um, magicians, let's say, and um, it was January 17th of 1921 when the first magician sawed a woman in half. And they're still doing it, right? I know it's kind of weird. I would know that fact, but there it is. So they they ask why? Why is that? So why are people still doing it? Why are people still amazed by it? And magicians answer the, that by saying, "It's the simplicity of it. It is just you know it, there, there's there's nothing fancy about it. It's the simplicity and." Um, they also said it can be described in a few words. Any good trick can be described in a few words. And I think that's what we're looking at here with how to use it. I think that Holmes sums up this teaching in a way that is, I know, and I know that I know. And it comes down to very simple, basic statements. And, and Holmes says, that we've made a riddle out of simplicity. 
and to return to a sane simplicity is one of the first and most important things to do. So we, we will, um, if because this is very direct and sometimes it's really hard to apply, if you have any specific questions, and we can't take a lot of questions, but please put them in the chat and Brian and I'll try and um, see if anybody has any questions when we get a little bit further into the conversation. So Brian, would you like to uh, say things here? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Neil. Uh, as you mentioned, this is actually one of my most favorite chapters in the textbook because this is our work. This is what our, is ours to do. I almost like to think of it not so much on the importance of how to use it, because in reality, we all know how to use it. It's like breathing. We know how to breathe. But the important thing is how to use it intentionally. For example, even with breathing, if you know, we know how to breathe, but if we want to sing or play a musical instrument, we have to breathe in a different way. If we want to whistle, we have to breathe in a different way. While we're meditating, we'll want to breathe in a different way. And it's all about the intention of that breath. And I believe the application of law is exactly the same way. And so it's a matter of training ourselves to use it consciously and intentionally. And that's, that's where I'm gonna start off. <laughs> All right. So um, you, we uh, had also earlier today talked about doubt and um, the, when you talk about how to use it, you cannot not use it. You're using it right now. It's being used all the time. And that is the basis of the, the, the main principle is that we are creative beings and we are creating all the time. Okay. So it's not a matter of if you're using it, it's a matter of, are you aware of your using it? And, um, and do you have any doubt about the power of it? So the I know, and I know that I know, is a very strong statement. And um, Ernest Holmes uh, says, there's nothing in me that can entertain doubt. There is no fear, discouragement, or uncertainty. I am filled with confidence with the expectancy of good with the knowledge that the spirit is always triumphant. I know that my word definitely reveres, uh, reverses, excuse me, uh, any and every negative situation. That's from a thing called you. So um, the basic understanding that we are always using this, as we had said uh, last week, when we talked about um, um, what it does, yeah, what it does is it works through us. This is expressed through us. This, this God lives through us to express itself through us as individuals and individual personalities as well. So the, um, the basic principle of this is that it is always working and we always have it. It is always present. It is never not present and we are always one with it. And the other part of it is that it only knows yes. Again, it came up this morning, the fact that, you know, there is God is all there is, and there can't be anything other than God. It would, there can't be God and something else. That would be duality, and that doesn't exist. So if God is all there is, and God always says yes, we need to know that that exists there for us, and we need to use it. We need to know 
that it is always applying to us as individuals and collectively as well. So, you know, it, it, it's funny, and again, I've used this in this talk before. It's like the old Toyota commercial, right? You asked for it, you got it, Toyota. In this case, it's you asked for it, you got it, God, got it covered. So, um, Brian, did you uh, want to interject here at any point? Go ahead. Yeah, that's a very, very simplistic way of putting it. And, but I still think a lot of us might ask, and we often ask over and over again, even as uh, steeped as we are in this teaching is, okay, but how do you do that? How do you use it? How do you ask for it? What am I missing? Because I'm not manifesting. And I think that is where there's a lot of great nuggets uh, in this chapter. One of my favorite uh, quotes is uh, from the first paragraph on page 57. I live in the spirit of truth and I'm conscious that the spirit of truth lives in me. My word is the law unto its own manifestation and will bring to me or cause me to be brought to its fulfillment. There is no unbelief, no doubt, no uncertainty. I know and I know that I know that's the important thing. I know that I know. Let every thought of doubt vanish from my mind that I may know the truth and the truth may make me free. A couple of things I love about that quote. Number one, I know and I know that I know. And like Neil said before, we take this a lot. This is, we're, we're going over how to use it. Um, whoever asked that question. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's how to use it. And if you're in the textbook, it's page 51. 57. Well, from what I'm reading. Well, well, from what he's reading, yeah, but the section starts on 51, right? Yep. So um, it's, it's not enough to know. It's, it's not enough to know intellectually. It's about allowing it to take over your default way of being. And this is why we treat on a regular basis. Uh, it almost reminds me of a great quote by Zig Ziglar. You know, people say motivation isn't good because it doesn't last. And his response was, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. And so this is what we do. This is why we say these words first to get our brains to start thinking in a way that we hadn't thought before. And then to build that pattern so that it becomes a part of who we are. I also like to look at this as uh, a great, another great analogy is planting seeds. Uh, it's been brought up in the SOME classes before. You know, sometimes, and, and uh, Dave Schwartz brought this up this morning, it's like, you know, sometimes we think the wrong thoughts. We, we say we want this, we want this, but there's something hidden. There's something underneath that we don't know what that is. Those things, those thoughts that we don't know what they are, they're like seeds in the ground. Seeds are only going to produce what those seeds produce. And so if we have inadvertently planted seeds that we don't want to grow, we need to not only dig in, discover them, uproot them, but then replant them with new seeds, seeds of what we want to have bear fruit. Um, another uh, thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, again, how do we do that? Uh, there's a number of uh, great teachers that I love. Uh, uh, Abraham Hicks, I think, said it best. The way to do that, you know, very often, you know, all of us have those moments where we have a thought that, you know, goes against what we know to be spiritual truth. Let's say, for example, we're having financial trouble and all we can think about is money. Money, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough money. I have enough money. How do we get ourselves out of that? Mm -hmm. Abraham Hicks teaches, choose a better feeling thought. All right, I don't have enough money, but I'm not gonna die of starvation the next few days. Not a great thought, but it's better. All right, I'm not gonna die of starvation in a few days, but you know, I have enough to get by. Better. All right, I have enough to get by, but you know, I have enough to buy even more. And I have enough for other things. I have enough for my bills. Oh, but okay, great. I have enough for my bills, but you know what? That money's gonna run out. Uh-uh, we gotta reverse that thought. I choose a better feeling thought. And then eventually you get to the level where you realize that when you have a thought that is in vibrational truth is, you know, money is abundant. I am worthy. I am worthy to receive it. It's possible. It's easy. Going through that, those steps allows us to bring that into fruition. Uh, I'll go back down, same on page 57 again, beginning the third paragraph. Healing and demonstration take place as our minds become attuned to the truth of being. 
Uh, I think one of the other ways of getting ourselves attuned to that truth of being, you know, it's really, well, I wanted to bring this example up. It's uh, taking a little bit of a step back. Uh, and I'll go back to one of my very first science of mind teachers, which was Yoda. For those of you who have seen The Empire Strikes Back, and if you haven't, I highly suggest that you do. One of the greatest moments of the film of the entire Star Wars saga is Luke Skywalker's got his ship stuck in the swamp and he's stuck on this planet. And Yoda says, what, you can't get your ship out? And he says, I can't, it's too big. And Yoda tells him that you cannot judge things by size, by appearance. You've got to understand that universal truth that there is no separation between yourself, the land, the ship. And Luke just gives up. He tries, he can't do it. And then Yoda demonstrates it. And Luke is astonished. And he goes to Yoda, he says, I don't believe it. And Yoda says, that is why you fail. And it's, it's in that simplicity. It's understanding that if your beliefs are not in attune to what you know to be true, you've got to go through those steps, reattune them, find a better feeling thought if you must, you know, whatever it takes to get there, practice, repetition, let this become part of your being. And that's how to use it. Avoiding worry, doubt, <clears throat> fear. Um, this past year for me personally has been a very interesting demonstration in that. And I've, I've had to go and do that over and over again, go back to rethinking my thoughts. Uh, just about a year ago, I had a lovely little chat with Reverend Michelle and uh, you know, we treated for the idea that I was just done with struggling. You know, I was working at a job that wasn't bringing me enough money and then having to do another job that in order to get enough money, I'd have to work a ridiculous amount of hours. And I was just working, 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 just getting by and like, you know what, I'm done. Don't want to do this. And then what happened? We had a shutdown. I had a health issue that made it even more important for me to stop what I was doing and just stay on my butt for a while. And, you know, it's like life kind of forced me in. And then all of a sudden, guess what? You know, I had financial support in the form of the stimulus packages and the unemployment benefits that were not available to me prior. And I'm like, okay, well, I need to allow my body to heal. I need to keep myself safe. What else can I do with this opportunity? You know, I ended up writing uh, a screenplay that I wanted to write for a long time. And it was probably one of the best things I've ever written. And then the year progressed and some of that money wasn't available. So I'm like, all right, I need a job now. I need to get myself back to work. The script's done. You know, I want to bring in more money. I want to demonstrate the wealth that I know I'm capable of. And I made a list of all the requirements that I wanted my job to be, you know, being able to make a certain amount, a certain amount that would be even more welcome, uh, flexibility in my schedule, partly remote, working with people with great integrity. And I struggled to find that for a while till I realized I was struggling. And then I had to say, I, no, I chose not to struggle. I know this job is there. I felt into that. I, I fell into that feeling of allowing it to be easy and graceful. Wouldn't you know that day, I saw something pop up. I got a phone call that night and an interview the next morning. And you know, now I'm in that position. And it's just, you know, so far working out to be very, very wonderful. But that's it. That's how it works. That's how you use it by feeling into that and just replacing those thoughts of struggle and strain with something different, something that is more in alignment with what it is you desire. Yeah, Brian, you use the word that you know that you have to believe it. And, you know, apparently we're, we've got a great Star Wars month going on here with Joel and, and you. Um, and, you know, to believe the power of your word uh, and, and, and your thoughts. And, you know, we talk about this all the time. Uh, I had mentioned uh, earlier to the group that yesterday Michelle taught this, how to use it um, on her radio show on the um, New Thought Media Network. And she had a, uh, a line in there that was good where she said, our thoughts are our mold. We create our reality by the things we constantly ponder the most. And the power of our thoughts and the power of our words can't be 
underestimated. As, er as Ernest Holmes says, we don't put the power into the word, but we do let the power of the law flow through it. And that's what makes it happen. And that's why it is, it always says yes, because that's the law. That's, that's the principle. It can't be any other way. Um, another example that's been given is like, you know, it's a law just like gravity. Gravity works. And, you know, there, this law is not a respecter of persons. It works the same for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Doesn't say, you know, okay, you know, today I'm going to work for Sally, but I'm not going to work for Donald. Or today I'm going to work for Carly, but I'm not going to work for uh, Beth or Paul. So it's not a respecter of persons. It has, you know, it's your, it, you, the mold is there and you can pour into it whatever you want and make whatever you want out of it. Now there's, there's tons of examples that we've all been through on how to use the power of our thoughts and our words. And I can remember where I was working back in March when COVID was going around and I'm working in the office and we were doing great. Everything was going fine. And then somebody walked into my office and said, you know what? I wish they would just shut us down so we could just go home and not worry about all this. Well, an hour later, four cops showed up at the door and told us we had to get out of the building. And it was like, oh man, just what? let's watch what we say because we have this power that's there all the time. So I, I, we, there's a couple of things that I think we need to cover. And one is how do you use the power of your word? And we all know that treatment is an extremely powerful way of using our word and that we need to use treatment. And please, if you haven't read these first four sections of the textbook yet, go back and read them. They're short sections. And they explain all this extremely well. But treatment is something that we do on an ongoing basis. And how often do we treat? How long do we treat? We treat until there's a demonstration, right? Or as we've said around our place before, it's push. Pray until something happens, push. So, you know, that we have the ability as a matter I, I'm sorry but I can't I can't do this chapter without reading the bottom of page 52 okay we read it all the time and I'm going to do it again because this is just it sums it all up bottom of page 52 the last paragraph hence it follows that if we believe that it will not work it really works by appearing to not work when we believe that it cannot and will not, then according to the principle, it does not. But when it does not, it still does. Only it does according to our belief that it will not. Our belief that it will not, or our belief that it will. You know, again, at the beginning, we said that this is very simple, and it really is, because the law is there. The principle is there. I can't change it. You can't change it. So why not use it to our best advantage? Now, I know if you're like me, there's times when I have treated and it, it appeared that nothing was happening, okay? So it takes time, right? It, it, you, you may not be able to sense the fact that it's working, but spirit knows it's working. This is, you know, not always an immediate bang, there it is, there's a period of time where it's shifting and you may not even be aware of it. And that, <clears throat> excuse me. And there's another portion of this as well. It may be appearing to work the opposite of what you're asking for. And you know, if you've been around long enough, you know the term chemicalization and that's when everything appears to be happening the opposite of what we want to have happen. 
and chemicalization is probably one of the best indicators other than the fact that boom all of a sudden it's uh, you get what you're trying to demonstrate but chemicalization is a great sign that it's working because with chemicalization we need to clear out and get rid of and make room for get rid of what we don't want and make room for what we do and um as Michelle said yesterday, we need to shed, okay, what we don't want. So be aware that shed happens. <laughs> and that is also, okay, I borrow that for some dog bumper stickers, you know, what can I tell you? <clears throat> but it's true, and it does happen. But it's a great indicator. Now, it was brought up this morning by Simon in our, in our meeting of the fact that, you know, um, the work that needs to be done. And the work is getting all that to the surface, getting our awareness greater. Maybe it's uncomfortable, but yeah, but that's the fun of it. The uncomfortable part means, okay, I'm finding out all that stuff that's not working and now I can replace it what is with what is. So um, the other part on this, and since I know that everybody here is very young, uh, that uh, we don't, we don't, um, okay, some of us are having birthdays and getting a little bit older, but this can happen at any time, at any age, as, as it was brought up this morning too, that the fact that it doesn't matter how old you are, and you've heard us say it, that you are the architect of your life and that you are never too old to know true happiness. You're never too old to have an awakening, to have a moment, to have an awareness, as long as you are conscious, you have the ability to have a greater consciousness. Brian? I actually wanted to build a little bit about what you are saying before in regards to chemical chemicalization and whatnot. Those are the times, especially when it is so important to practice that muscle and build that muscle of faith, of shifting your consciousness, of shifting your thoughts, because those are the times when it's easiest to forget and go into default mode and go into that panic and fear and doubt. But I just wanted to point out that that is, I think, the most important time to build that muscle because that's when things happen miraculously. Uh, I shared this story before, uh, going back three years ago, um, I was in danger of losing my condo and I realized, you know what, it's happening. There's nothing I can do about it. It was like a tidal wave coming. And so I had to make a choice metaphorically. If there's a tidal wave coming, I can either drown in it or I can break out my surfboard and go for a ride. So I chose the latter and I recognized that, hey, you know what? I'm ready for a change. I want a change anyway. And things just seem to fall into place exactly at the right time. Once I had that attitude, once I made that conscious choice and held on to that vibration of everything working out and by almost default, ended up finding the right apartment that was best suited for me and my kids and everything in my life. Uh, it, it was everything I had asked for again. It's only because I knew that I was holding that right thought and keeping that right feeling about it. So, you know, when you see a tidal wave, choose drown or take out your surfboard. Yeah, and again, to talk to the simplicity of this, um, you have heard it here from Reverend Michelle numerous times as within, so without. So what we know inside, what we know creates the outside. How do we know what our consciousness is? We look around. We're creating this all the time. Right now, every minute, all the time. So every word, 
and I, I, I believe this is from Holmes in the book. Um, every word must reproduce the creative function of spirit in your life at the level of your consciousness. This will only work to the level at which you embody it. Evelyn, do we have any specific questions that came up? What I'm seeing really is just comments. Um, so Don Lee says, chemicalization, ending the treatment with joy, ease, and grace. And um, Madam Pinkley says on page 57, the truth is instantaneous in its demonstration, taking only such time in its unfoldment as, in, as is inherent in the law of logical and sequential evolution, a natural gestation period. And Madam Pinkley knows a thing or two. Mm -hmm. And then She's Gary Frank says, what we believe and think becomes our lives. Yeah, the, Gary, that just wraps up what I just said at the end there. No, there's no doubt about it. You want to know what your life is, look around, you want to know what your consciousness is, just look around you, Ab absolutely. So we have this incredible power. Just, you know, it's... <laughs> I think it's beyond our comprehension. To be honest with you, I think the reason that we stumble over this sometimes, yeah, we talked about doubt uh, and, and uh, you know, that it's, that we doubt it, but I think we have a hard time convincing ourselves that we have this unbelievable level of power at our fingertips in our consciousness all the time. Evelyn. I have a question. All um, right. So Patricia Lewis says, oh, first of all, I should say, ask Patricia. Oh, yes, she did say, sorry. How do, how do you get rid of a thought that you've had for years that's hindering you that you don't even know is in your mind? Brian, you want to answer that or do you want me to? I'll start. Okay. I'm sure you'll, I'm sure you'll be able to add to it. How do you find a thought that you don't even know? That's where a lot of good, deep meditation can help. Discovering your thoughts, you know, going deep within, doing things like soul journaling. Like you can ask yourself, you know, what thought is there that is keeping me from what I wish to create? And do some freestyle writing. That's one way of doing it. You know, a lot of times you just have to relax into it. You feel into it. You ask yourself questions. You know, why do I feel this? And you look for the thought that is creating that feeling. Okay, I'm feeling that. What's creating, what thought is creating that feeling? And keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper till you can unlock what that core belief is, that core thought. Uh, you know, probably something that you learned from an experience as a child or maybe even later in life. Something happened along the way that, you know, allowed your default way of thinking to be a certain way. And so when you go back to that moment, uncover it, realize what the truth is, apply the truth to that situation, again, is that series of choosing better feeling thoughts. Yeah, I, I agree that if you're not aware of the thought, you are aware of the feeling. And if you follow the feeling, it'll lead you to there. And, um, and then if you are aware of the thought, you need to replace it with another thought because we're, we're just sitting here saying that we have the power to change our thoughts. We have the power, as long as you're aware of it, to observe it and replace it with something else. Yeah, so Neil, um, Donald has his hand raised and he has a question. Donald. Donald is muted. No? Oh, okay. Well, all right. I'm getting the hand gestures. I guess Donald is withdrawing his question. <laughs> all right, Donald. It was nice not talking to you. <laughs> I want to go back again to page, uh, bottom of page 58. And this goes a little bit back to what I was saying before too, but again, in trying to find that thought that uh, may be blocking you and hindering you, but shifting even your consciousness and your focus toward 
that solution. We should work not with anxiety, but with expectancy, not by coercion, but with conviction, not through compulsion, but in a state of conscious recognition and receptivity. We do not have to drive or push, but we must accept and believe. We should then leave everything to law, expecting full and complete proof of our faith. We shall not be disappointed or chagrined, for the law is our faithful servant. So even if you can't find that thought, a lot of times if you go back and just develop that faith, can develop that conviction, sometimes that thought can just naturally dissolve because it's being replaced by something new. All right, I think we've kind of reached the end of time here. Um, the, um, unless everybody's got another two or three hours because we could talk about this going on because this is just, this is gold, this is great stuff. And this is this, is this how to use it is, just really, really the, the, what it, that's why it's the fourth one in the line. It all leads up to this because the goal here is to lead a happy life. And you lead a happy life by leading an authentic life, a life that you're creating that you want to live. And we have the power to do it. If you need to if you look and you say okay i'm not sure i have the power well you had the power to get create wherever you are now you've created where you are now it took a lot of work it took a lot of power it took a lot to get you where you are now so you can do it it didn't just happen to you so if you're not happy with where you are now use the power that's there I see one more hand raised and then I think we need to treat out. <coughs> Patricia? All right, uh, one of the reasons, well, not one of the reasons, the reason why I asked that question, because I already know the answer, but it took me decades to learn the answer, the answer to what there is, if there's a thought that's hindering you that you don't even know that's there. And I say that because the way I grew up, my mother would always uh, think of first the worst case scenario, scenario of what could happen if this happens. So I didn't know I was programmed like that. And so growing up, I always say, if somebody came up to me with something, I was always changing. The light switch would go up and I would change it to a negative, like, you know, what is the worst thing that could happen? And I realized that that's how I was running my life. And when I found out that that is what was happening. I mean, it's, this takes a case of being able to like monitoring your thoughts all the time. And this it does take years of pra practice like Michelle said, Rep. Michelle says, but that can change your life. I mean, I just realized this like not long ago, how I was programmed like that. Like someone would say, well, let's go ahead and let's go bounce the ball. And then I would automatically say, well, what if the ball bursts before we bounce it? And so, I mean, the bottom line is I put that negative there first and now I've learned to put the positive there first. Like yeah. someone says to go bounce a ball, then I say, oh yes, that ball's gonna bounce really high and we're gonna have a lot of fun instead of saying what if the ball pops. So yeah. I, just, I just say that because I just, I knew the answer to my question, but I think it's very important for everybody, everybody to know that that programming that you grew up with from a child is so crucial. Yeah, and yeah. you know what? And, Go ahead, Brian. Oh, hang on. I did the wrong thing here. Hold on. <laughs> uh, what I was going to say is, you know, once you can discover what that thought is, that hidden thought, that hidden belief, you know, thinking what's the worst that can happen, then it's real easy to find that new thought. Now you can consciously apply to every situation. What's the best thing that can happen? Yes, yes. Yeah, and I was just going to mention too, and it looks like Bill's beating me to it. It doesn't take, you know, it may have taken you 10 years to, um, to be, you're, you're unaware for years and it's 10 years and you're there in that place. But the one thing, well, two things really that can change that awareness. Okay. When you create the awareness and you couple that with accessing teaching like this, 
you have you not only have the awareness which is necessary, but you have the tools in which to deal with it. And that's why Bill's teaching the awareness class. And that's what he would like us to plug. So, uh, you know, if you um, if you are wondering about whether your awareness is where it should be, get into a class like Bill's work on that awareness. So, um, Brian, you and I didn't discuss this, but do you want to treat us out or do you want me to? I was just thinking about that. I'll go ahead and do it. All right. Thanks. All right. <sighs> so breathing into this moment, this one now moment, the only moment that there is, I know that I am one with my one. I know my highest truth. And I know that I am one with this thing itself, that I understand what it does, that I understand how it works. And that now understanding all that, I know how to use it. What a wonderful, wonderful journey this human life is, full of discovery and wonder and discovering more and more, discovering exactly who and what we are, discovering exactly how powerful we are, discovering exactly what our work is and discovering more and more how to do that work better and better to create more good in this world, to create more of what we desire in this world, to express everything that we are in full demonstration. I know that this is true for me, that this is true for all, and this is true for everyone in the sound of my voice and beyond, because we are all one. What a wonderful, wonderful, joyous voyage this is. And I'm grateful for this and so much more and grateful for any and every benefit that comes as a result of this knowing for this law and for its proper application. And in this gratitude and love and joy, I surrender this word. And please join with me in saying, and so it is. And so it is. Thank you all. <laughs>